Welcome to Global Perspectives. What does one do after a long, successful career of transforming the world? For answers, we turn to Mary Robinson, former president of Ireland. Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator, John Bercia. Welcome to the show, President Robinson. Thank you. Well, the answer to the question is you continue transforming the world. But before we get into what you're doing in that regard, Take us back to a long time ago when you were not transforming the world, but thinking about it. What, what was life like growing up and what, what were your interests then and how did it turn into something global? Well, I do often joke that I had an early interest in human rights and gender equality because I grew up in the west of Ireland between four brothers, two older than me and two younger than me. So I had to assert myself and use my elbows and make it clear that whatever they could do, I could do at least as well. And I had wonderful parents, I must say, who made it clear to me that I had every opportunity to uh, do whatever I wanted to do in the same way as my brothers and that they would support me going to college, going to whatever. And that wasn't, uh, wasn't the atmosphere outside my family. In the west of Ireland at that time, women knew their place in Ireland generally. And there were very few options. You could get married, you could become a nun. If you were talented, you could write, but that was about it. What was your first significant experience in another country? Uh, it wasn't really until law school in, in Harvard that I lived outside Ireland for a year. Uh, I had graduated from Trinity and went straight to the Harvard Law School to do a master's. And it was a wonderful year in Harvard because I'm the class of 1968. And that was a year of great idealism in the university and, and in the law school. Uh, people were complaining about what they regarded as an unjust war, the war in Vietnam, but they were also preoccupied with civil rights in the south of this country, poverty, including especially in the south, and many of my contemporaries, many of my peers were not going to the Wall Street firms and Washington firms, etc. They were going into poverty programs, and the teachers were using teaching of law to encourage us to think about society. Uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated in April, and uh, just after I graduated, Robert Kennedy was assassinated. But I went back to Ireland full of what young people could do to contribute to their society. And that seems to be what many young people are doing again today. I, I hope it turns into a tidal wave of activism and engagement. We really need that now. That's why I like talking to audiences of young people, because we need their energy, their imagination, and their sense that they are going to be living through any mistakes that we've made, and in particular, to get on top of things like climate change. Now, you were a practicing lawyer, but then you also were interested in politics, and you started that relatively soon. And, and we hear a lot about your presidency, but what about the period before that when you did a lot of legislative work? Well, thanks to having been in Harvard, I think it must have been the Harvard Law School humility, um, I asked a question when our elections came around as to why it was always elderly male professors who stood for the six university seats in the two university streams uh, voted on by the graduates of the universities. And my colleague said, well, you know, if you feel like that, why don't you stand? And I was 25 at the time, and I said, well, you know, um, I have a number of disadvantages, but let's see. And we fought a great rolling campaign, and I got elected at the age of 25 to the Senate. And that was a wonderful experience because I was able to take part in changes in the law, and I wanted to open up Irish society. I very much had a program uh, starting with legalizing family planning and going on to issues on education, on uh, changing the law um, that regarded children born out, out of marriage as illegitimate. I said no child should be ever characterized as being illegitimate and so on. So in thinking about the presidency, was that something you had dreamt about or did others sort of encourage you to move in that direction or did it just happen because you were in the right place at the right time with the right credentials? I had in fact retired from politics after 20 years in the Irish Senate because I was very busy with my law practice. We had three quite young children. Uh, my husband and myself were involved in a center for European law, European community law, European Union law in Trinity. And uh, I was very surprised to get a visit from a former Attorney General of Ireland who was um, asked by the Labour Party, which he belonged to, to see whether I might become um, a candidate of the Labour Party for contesting the, the election next year of the presidency. And I looked at him in great surprise. And uh, he could see from my face that I wasn't particularly 
um, attracted, but it was an honour to be invited. So I said, well, um, let me think about it over the weekend. And uh, I then rang my husband and said, you know, you won't believe this, but I've been asked if I might be a candidate for the presidency. And he said, well, it's Valentine's Day, so come to lunch and we discuss it. And when we had lunch, I remember him saying to me, you know, you, you pride yourself as being on a, a constitutional lawyer. You've taken many constitutional cases. Have you ever read the provisions of the constitution about the presidency? And to be honest, I hadn't. I had sort of skipped that bit because it wasn't relevant. The Irish uh, presidency is not like the United States or France or African countries. Um, it's a non-executive presidency where the prime minister, whom we call the Taoiseach, holds the power. And uh, it's a parliamentary system. So the Taoiseach is head of the parliamentary government, the cabinet. And uh, the presidency had been distinguished men who had served well in di different capacities, either politically or in one case a judge, and uh, who um, took on the presidency as a, a semi-retirement post, very prestigious, representing Ireland abroad, red carpet coming out, bands playing, but not much relevance to normal Irish life. And so following Nick's encouragement, my husband's encouragement, I did read the provisions and I realized that a directly elected president could play an enormously significant role, side by side with the political power being with the Taoiseach and government. And uh, it could be done locally, it could be done nationally, and it could be done internationally. So I started to make that case. I accepted to be the candidate of the Labour Party, but to run as an independent. And I was, joined, I was supported by other small parties in Ireland. And I knew that the Deputy Prime Minister would be the candidate of the main biggest party, and that there would be another man um, for the second biggest party. And uh, I expected the Deputy Prime Minister would be the favourite, which he was. And I was almost making the case that whoever became president now in this election should do it in a much more proactive, relevant, meaningful way, close to the people, representing the Ireland that we should be proud of, the Ireland that we should speak up for. And uh, people liked what I said, and so as it went forward, I realized I had a chance of winning, and then um, uh, I did uh, win the election. And it was, it was a very significant election because uh, people voted for change, and I represented a change that was more about openness, openness to Northern Ireland, very much uh, Ireland's place in the world and the role that we could play, especially on human rights and gender. So you were riding a tsunami of change just as the world was going through. Of the most yes, it was a wonderful time because it was exactly a year to the day after the fall of the Berlin Wall that I was elected, the actual election. The uh, inauguration was a little bit different well, later. I said in um, the excitement of winning the election itself, I said, I, I thanked and I gave them the Irish name, Manon Aheron. I thanked the women of Ireland who instead of rocking the cradle, rocked the system, was the phrase I used and it's been tweeted many times since then. But, and in my inauguration, I said that I wanted women who'd been outside history to be written back into history. And I was very conscious as the first woman elected to the presidency in Ireland to do it very positively as a woman, not to be trying to do it as a sort of man or imitating a male way of doing it, but to do it very positively as it being such an advantage to be a woman and be president of my country. I know you were there for many years and probably can't count the accomplishments that you remember fondly, but w were there three of your achievements during your presidency that you could point to as, as some of your favorites? I don't know if you'd call them achievements so much as very, very memorable times. Um, I had hoped I could do something at the, at the international level for human rights. And I was asked by the Irish aid agencies and agreed, and the government approved my going to Somalia in 1992, two years after I became president, because there was a terrible situation there. There were f warlords fighting and preventing food from getting to the feeding stations, which were trying to feed people in a very much a famine context. And uh, so I went there, met the warlords, um, and my husband even says I poked them in the tummy. I didn't actually, but I did speak to them quite strongly. And then I went to the UN and Boutros Ghali was the um, Secretary General at the time, and he was amazed that the head of state of a Western country would have bothered to go to a back place like Somalia and come to the UN and say, you must do more. You know, I remember him, ever afterwards, he said to me, that was a really 
significant uh, time. I think it was shortly after that that President Clinton decided to send troops into Somalia and it didn't work out very well, but the intention was good. Two years later, I went to Rwanda as the first head of state to visit after their terrible genocidal killing. So that, that was two occasions. I think I have to give you a, a fourth. The third would have been going to Republican West Belfast, which had been very isolated. It meant that I had to shake the hand of Jerry Adams, and I got much criticism for that, particularly from the United Kingdom, but even from Dublin newspapers in the beginning. But the people of Ireland liked that I had done it, the people of my country. And um, just before that, I had visited Queen Elizabeth in Buckingham Palace and taken tea with her. Later, I made an official visit and I met the Queen on a number of occasions. But that first visit was the first time that uh, the Queen of the United Kingdom and elsewhere stat stood side by side with the President of Ireland, two women on equal terms. And it meant a great deal it meant a great deal to the Irish in Britain at that time and to Ireland generally. You know, people were very proud of the fact that we could stand tall um, uh, you know, as a country that had come of age and was open to the world. Your gesture of reaching out to me perhaps was criticized, but it's essential when it comes to reconciliation. I'm thinking about Desmond Tutu and yeah. his book. You, know, yeah. you don't make um, peace unless you open yourself to the other. And I think it really is very important. So you were in the final period of your presidency, and another opportunity emerged. And it actually, did, did it, am I remembering correctly, did it conflict with the scheduling, and you had to depart the presidency a bit early to take on the UN post, or am I mixing no, my that, history? That, that's correct. Uh, what happened was um, I had a terribly difficult decision to make in early 1997, which was whether I would go for another seven-year term. I loved the job. I was completely committed to it. Every day I worked as hard as I could to fulfill the honor of being president of my country. And I would have loved to do another three or four years, but in my heart I knew it would be difficult to do it at the same level for seven years. And my husband and most of my friends sort of said, look, you've opened up the presidency, now move on. Let somebody else take it over. And eventually I announced that I wouldn't seek a second term and I had no idea what I might do when literally about three weeks later, the first UN High Commissioner for Human Rights suddenly resigned to go back to his country, Ecuador. He had actually found the job extremely difficult. The Irish government put me forward and Kofi Annan appointed me in July of 1997, but he wanted me to come early because he not only had no High Commissioner, but the deputy had also been moved because they had fought apparently and anyway, there was nobody heading this important office of the UN. And so I said, um, well, I, you know, I, 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 I can't come until at least September when the General Assembly would be meeting and that's when he wanted me to come. It was actually a mistake on my part. I should have said, look, uh, I'm sorry, but I have to see out my term as president, wait for me. I was actually afraid he wouldn't wait, that he might, you know, because I knew he was anxious to have the office filled um, but I did start on the 12th of December of, of September. It meant that I didn't take a holiday that summer and I worked twice as hard because I even took things, you know, that I was going to do later and did them during the summer and, you know, and, and packed at night. Um, and then went on the same day from being President of Ireland to being High Commissioner for Human Rights, which was incredibly stupid. I mean, when I look back at how stupid it was, because the job was extremely difficult, the office was underfunded, undersupported. It took a huge effort to build it up. It actually nearly broke me, as I made clear in my memoir. You know, it, it really was very tough well, for I, the I first few months, and then after that it got better. I remember reading about that and thinking, mm. you just finished a job that was mm. incredibly difficult, partly because you were the first woman serving mm. in that capacity, and then you move into a job where you're blowing into the wind on a global <laughs> basis around the world. You must have been physically exhausted. I actually didn't want to write about how much of a toll it took on me. I didn't want to show my weakness, if you like, but my daughter helped me write the book. She said, no, Mom, I remember. You've got to tell that. It, I, I very nearly had a breakdown. I was taking sleeping pills. I was becoming slightly paranoid. Um, I just was worrying so much about the job. And then I took a break at Christmas um, after only three and a half months or whatever it was, September to, to December. And a brother of mine who'd come back from New Zealand, who was a doctor, said to me, you know, the older brother, you know, you're in danger of having a, a breakdown. And I said, no way, <laughs> that brother's voice in my ear. 
And I took a bit of a longer break, um, threw away the sleeping tablets and said, I have to get myself back into, you know, a proper balance on this. And when I went back to work, I somehow found I was able to work with a team more, were able to share the problem more, able to work forward. I had a great crowd of very good human rights people working with me. And we built up the office in a way that I became very proud of. And I stayed on an extra year, which was the year um, after the terrible attacks of 9-11, just literally from that day until the first anniversary of 9-11, or my last year as High Commissioner. And I found I had to criticize the Bush administration for compromising on torture, for um, bending rules of law that shouldn't be bent in the way that, um, that was being done. Because addressing the Taliban issue, the Al-Qaeda issue, by, by saying we are at war, as opposed to we will go after those and bring them to justice and have the whole world with us. The, the paradigm of being at war mean you undermine human rights more easily when you're at war. And still you had not had enough. So you, you, you finished with, with this assignment and then uh, you're still engaging in work that's transforming about, the world. I became about taking more seriously the stream of human rights that we don't take seriously enough even now in the richer parts of the world. That's rights to food and safe water, health, education, shelter. These are human rights. There's a whole literature about human rights about them. But we see them too much as kind of political aspirations as opposed to human rights. And so I decided to work in African countries on economic and social rights. And that brought me to climate. As High Commissioner, I hadn't made any speech on climate change because another part of the UN was dealing with it. And I was in my silo on human rights and gender and women's leadership thing. And when I heard so many particularly women in villages in Africa where I was working say to me, things are so much worse. And when I'd ask them, they'd say, we don't know when to sow, we don't know when to harvest. We're devastated. We had terrible flooding that destroyed the school, destroyed the village. We formed a women's group. Um, all over Africa, I was hearing these stories. And this was 2003, 2004, 2005. By the time I went to my first conference on climate, which was Copenhagen, I really had a, a, a strong sense that this was becoming the biggest human rights issue um, that I could imagine for our, for our world, because I was reading the science and seeing that we were not on track for a safe world. So what, what, what happened as you continued to encounter this, this well, nonstop I, yeah, garage? I did, my, I did my own thing. I went back to Ireland and, and, and established a foundation on climate justice. Climate justice is that kind of link of a moral sort between the fact that it's those who are poorest, most marginalized, and least responsible for the problem of climate change because they don't drive cars, they don't have central heating, they don't have big manufacturing, which is all, causes all the emissions. And, um, and yet they're the most affected now. Um, they're like the canaries in the mine. They're the ones that are suffering now. More resilient, richer countries will suffer more later. The climate justice also wants um, those who suffered most to benefit from renewable energy to address that gap of people where you have 1.2 billion who never switch a switch for electricity. So we had our foundation and then I had mandates from the UN because they know me well at this stage. And I served before the Paris Climate Agreement as the special envoy of the Secretary General. And then the year after the Paris Agreement in 2016, I drew attention to the impacts of El Nino and climate as the special envoy of the Secretary General. And so I'm I, that gives me great access in our work in the foundation to decision makers on climate issues. Tell us about the impact that climate war and other problems around the world have on the people who unfortunately are in the lower socioeconomic uh, areas, especially women. And, and I'm thinking if we can end up with the impact on them in terms of human rights and the human trafficking issue, yeah. I think that would be very helpful. Yeah, I must say, I, I really uh, feel very conscious of what the impact of uh, extreme weather um, is and, and, and has on women in particular. Women respond in two ways. They are victims, and very often, if there's a sudden onset of a flood, for example, it's harder for them to escape. They have longer skirts. They worry about their children. Or they, they don't run and the men run faster. And so statistically, far more women are drowned, I think. But if it's a slow onset drought over long periods so that the place is unlivable and they have to move, that also can have very severe impacts. Um, 
It was drought for four years that started the conflict in uh, Syria. Now we have you know, those who are driven out of Syria, and they are genuine refugees because it's the conflict that's driving them out, but they're also climate displaced people. And we know they're being trafficked, trafficked across the Mediterranean, losing their lives, being sold as slaves in Libya in you know, the 21st century. I mean, it's a shocking thing. And uh, when you have conflict and displacement, when you have a situation like that that affects women, when they're displaced from the safeness of their home context, of their village, of their slum, of their area that they know and their neighbours are there, they are very vulnerable to trafficking. Children are very vulnerable to trafficking. Um, I, I did a lot of work on trafficking when I was serving as, as uh, UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. I addressed the parliament in Cambodia. And when I had addressed them, I went to a small NGO, a very brave lady in Cambodia, and she showed me children from Laos, from uh, Myanmar, from the, as well as from um, uh, Cambodia itself. And then she said to me, you address the parliament in, here in our country. And I said, yes. Do you know that many of the worst offenders, who are the worst traffickers, are in that parliament? You know, so it's really important that we understand uh, that human rights is always a struggle. That we, we, we have to be prepared to continue to fight, to continue to say that universal, human rights are universal. We have a lot of populism at the moment. We have a lot of undermining of values. We have a lot of author authoritarian governments who don't want to hear about human rights and accountability to their people in the way that um, human rights requires. And we have to continue to fight that. I'm just wondering how you overcome those kinds of hurdles because culture plays such an important role in all of this. You go to China and you talk about human rights and they say, well, we believe in human rights but with Chinese characteristics. And you go to some place like Cambodia and others mm. where they have a human trafficking problem and you explain to them what you perceive mm. the problem to be. Mm. And some of these same officials that you just referenced, you know, without mm. any names, look at you like, well, what's the problem with that? Well, I became aware and then very much talked about this, that human rights have to be embedded in the culture of a country. I made seven working visits to China as High Commissioner for Human Rights, and I talked to, to, to the Chinese in a way that they appreciated. I gave them credit for taking a lot of their people out of poverty and therefore helping their rights to food and safe water, health. They ratified the Covenant on Economic and Social Rights um, during my time. They signed the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, but they still haven't ratified it. Uh, it's harder for them on the civil and political side because um, they won't open their country. Um, they repress labor, they repress the Tibetan people, they repress the Falun Gong, and I raised all those issues. But I did it in a balanced way, acknowledging the progress they were making. S similarly, you know, you have to address issues like early child marriage um, as a harmful traditional practice, but you have to address it culturally by working with women from within the country, villagers from within the country, to understand that this is a harmful practice, it's bad for girls, it's bad for their children if they marry because they're too young to cope with the responsibilities of marriage, or they'll die in childbirth because they're physically too young. But that's all change, all real change, comes from within countries, culturally. And working in that way, you work in a much deeper way. So where do you feel the whole issue of human trafficking and, and the broader issue of human rights is going? Are, are you optimistic that we will see some tremendous improvements over the next few decades, or are we in for a rough spot along with everything else? I think things are quite rough at the moment because of populism, because of um, nationalism, America first-ism, and other isms, um, because of authoritarian leaders um, uh, you know, Putin and um, in the Philippines and Turkey, in China for that matter, they're becoming more and more a trend of the strong man, the authoritarian, and they are not good for human rights in the short term. And then we have the displacement going on through conflict and increasingly through climate, climate change. But uh, we have to have hope. I mean, I like to tell the story of Archbishop Tutu and how he taught me this wonderful lesson when we were in, together on a, on a platform in New York uh, in front of young people um, a social good platform and they were all on tweeting on their iPads and their phones and he becomes very excited of Tutu when he's in front of children or uh, young people and he was expressing his love for them and his belief in young people and this journalist who was interviewing us uh, pulled him up quite sharply she said Archbishop Tutu why are you such an optimist and he looked at her and he shook his head and he said oh no dear I'm not an optimist I'm a prisoner of hope and that is a profound 
expression. We all have to be prisoners of hope because that means you find the glass may not be half full, but you find what is in the glass that you can work with and you work with it. And that's what people do all over the world in defending human rights, in defending land rights and water rights, in standing up to mining companies and standing up to authoritarian regimes. There are people in China who are fighting for human rights in very difficult circumstances. They're the ones that inspire me. They give me hope because they are prisoners of hope in the full sense. We've been discussing very heavy topics. We're almost out of time, but I have to ask you, what do you do to escape? What, how do you re-energize yourself? I know that you studied in <laughs> France and you have a fondness for Edith Piaf and, and her I do. Music. I, love, I love the music of Edith Piaf. I love uh, especially Je ne regrette rien. Mm. I do not regret anything. But also, uh, I love dancing. Uh, when I'm in Africa with my African women friends, uh, they know when Mary comes, we have to dance. Uh, I don't sing. A lot of Irish people can sing. I can't sing. My husband can sing, thankfully. So if, if we're in a group, he sings for me too. But I love to dance. Um, I love being with friends, going for long walks, reading, uh, very simple things. I, I actually relax very easily. I learned that from my father, who was a medical doctor, who worked very hard. He was a vocational doctor. He really cared about his patients. He would rarely take even a weekend off. Because they, but when he took a holiday, he completely took a holiday. And um, I, you know, even if it's only a long weekend, cut off, turn the phone off, relax. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us today, President Robinson. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you. For Global Perspectives, I'm John Bercia. We'll see you next time.